Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting thing. I feel like the CPA has gotten out there, you know, the, you know, it's like, I feel like in the last few years it's become, you know, more widely applied for, which is good, but it's like when you have so much in requests, it's like, you can't, you know, how, how, how do you fund, you know, five, six times more than what you have available. It's just not. I know. Yeah. I mean, if you take all the things that, if you put our proposal and the three that we've been asked to support, it's like three, almost three and a half million dollars worth of proposals. Right. Yeah. That's like, that's, <laughs> you don't need anybody else to apply CPA. You just need us. <laughs> <laughs> us and our cohorts. And that's it. Yeah. Be, <laughs> no. yeah, I'm going to be back in a second and ready to start this. Okay, Risha. Hi, Risha. Hello. How is everyone? Uh, hanging in. How about you? Good. I'm in a new place, and I'm realizing there's a light right behind my head. So let's see if I can. Yeah. Go. Huh. I like the, the. We have a rug that looks almost like. The what's the background behind you? Yeah, it's behind like you. It. Yeah, it's yeah. fake tile. <laughs> Very nice. Good. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Did you get so a I chance wanna... to go, go ahead? ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask if you got a chance to look at some of the proposals and stuff. I did. I, I was actually going to ask while well, we're waiting for people. Um, a. Uh, what is that open meeting question? Because I hesitated to email both of you and ask how the forum went, because I didn't want to start a three person conversation. Um, what would be the proper way? So I just I emailed John because oh, I just good. wanted to know how the forum went. That's for good because he's not on the trust, so he can do whatever he wants now. <laughs> but, but I wanted to know what the proper way of just I mean, is it breaking anything to ask for information? I just don't want to accidentally start a conversation as the. It's a good question, and I don't know the answer because it's not a it's not a policy thing. It's not anything we're doing anything about. If you're just asking how did something go, it seems like it should be okay, but and, and just an, an issue with co-chairs is that it automatically makes three. <laughs> exactly. So I, I could just email one of you, but <laughs> yeah, I, maybe Nate has an opinion. <clears throat> it's a total violation. No, um, I think that's a, I think. <laughs> I think it's fine. I think, um, you know, if you're just trying to get a recap on something, I don't, that's not a violation of open meeting. I mean, it would be more like, you know, you're, you hear, you know, you're taking something from the forum and you're saying, well, um, oh, you know, like Wayfinder's proposal, I really think we should recommend changing this. And what about this? And then all of a sudden, right. you know, um, you know, you talk to Carol and it's not even if it's at the same uh, email or conversation, but they consider serial conversation a violation. So, you talk to Carol, then you talk to, um, you know, you talk to someone else and then they talk to Erica and all of a sudden four members of the trust have been talking, you know, in a, you know, independently, but as a part of a serial conversation. So, but I think asking how something went's fine. You know, sharing information is fine. If you read a great article, you know, I say share it, right? So you can send it to me or the co-chairs and ask them to distribute it. And then, you know, typically, you know, Erica or Carol, if you did that, we would just say, please don't reply all, but, you know, here's a great article from, you know, something, or here's a training that's coming up. Um, you know, I think what happens, the tendency is people tend to reply with some comments. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what you can't do. Yeah. So it's never, I feel like it's never um, intentional or malicious. It's just. Yeah. And I didn't want to accidentally, I mean, it's pretty hard to give a recap without giving any opinions on anything you know because it's a like oh that <laughs> went well or that one um so anyway i i understand it was sort of that nothing came out that was a huge surprise there was no big like opposition to anything that was not expected or so that was great no i mean you know one of the neighbors immediate neighbors to east street school has you know has emailed the town and wayfinders um, just, you know, with some concerns and questions, uh, but that's, um, I mean, that was kind of expected, right? That the most immediate yeah. neighbor would, or neighbors would. Nate, it looks like Rob's here. Yeah, I just, um, 
you just promoted him or whatever you do. I know it does feel like the promoted to panelist is always promoted. <laughs> we need one and more George person. Ryan is here. Thank you for being here, George. We're grateful for your note taking. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Rob. We need one more. Yeah, yeah after the list arrives. All right. Great. So, uh, hi, Ashley. Uh, Sid's here. Oh, good. Then oh, great. I'm wondering about Sid. So that's probably it because we heard from both um, Paul, Paul, and Allegra that they won't make it to this one. So I believe this is us for today. Hi, Sid. Hi, oh, yeah, yeah, Ashley. Hello. Nice. All right. Well, then I will start. Oh, Thank yeah. you all. Sorry, oh, sorry. Let me just automatically starts recording now. All right. Yeah, no, it started as soon as you started. Um, yeah, I, I think the IT set it up so people wouldn't forget. So the minute you start a webinar, it, it automatically starts recording now. Okay. I have to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much, and um, I hope all of you are well. So we're going to start um, our Amherst Municipal Affordable House meet, um, Housing Meeting uh, today, Thursday, October 13th, um, and we're going to go with the agenda. So I'm going to call uh, the meeting to order, and uh, we're going to start first uh, with a review of September's meeting notes. Uh, so again, thank you, George, for putting the meeting minutes together. Um, I hope everyone has had an opportunity to review them. Uh, I believe they were sent out with a few corrections. Um, and so um, if we agree to accept them, then we're uh, agreeing to accept them with the corrections that were um, part of the meeting minutes. So I'm opening it up to anybody who has any other corrections or would like to add anything to the meeting minutes from September. All right not hearing any um, any other corrections or any comments, I believe that we agree to accept the meeting minutes for September's meeting. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll move to the next item. Our next item is review and discussions of the CPA proposal. There were three and Carol's gonna lead us um, on this discussion. Yeah, so I wonder who is, the only person who is here at the moment is Amherst Community Connections of the three ones that we wanted to review. I believe that Wayfinders and Valley were expecting to send someone. If they don't, that's okay too. But since uh, Amherst Community Connections is here, why don't we start with that one and let, please, please give us a brief, some brief highlights, Wayling. I presume it's you who's there and, uh, and then we'll see if we have any questions and go from there. Yeah, hi, Wayling, or Amherst Community Connections. I, I'll allow you to talk. I thought I promoted you to a panelist, but okay, yeah. So I'm joining you as a panelist or stay as yes. attendee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're a panelist now. Yeah, so that's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, I know you cannot see me, but I have a beautiful smile for you all. Thank you so much for serving on the committee. It's seven o'clock. I bet you had a full day of work. You just came home and you haven't even had supper and you are sitting here listening to me blabbering. I appreciate <laughs> that. So my name is Huilin Greeny and I am representing the Amherst Community Connections. And this year we filed a application for the CDBG fund. And the purpose of this funding is tied to our proposal that we sent to CPA for a rental subsidy program phase two. Now, most of you have heard that we used to run a housing first, phase one, phase two. It was a great success. And now we had another program started three years ago. It was rental subsidy phase one. And it ran for three years. So by this coming February, 
it will end, will expire. And that fund supports six families, which include individuals and family with children. And what we do is to provide $400 of subsidy to them after they pay their rent. They will come to our office, show the receipt, and we will reimburse them $400 of their rent that they paid. And the criteria to be admitted to this phase one and phase two program, the same. A, they have to be Amherst renters. They cannot be homeowners and they cannot be living in other towns because we are talking about a CPA that we were applying as a for, uh, Amherst residents. So that's one. Two, they have to be low income in a sense that they cannot make more than 50% of the area median income, which is about $29,900. So third, that they had to be paying 50% or more of the income for rent. As the HUD defined, people who are severely rent burdened is exactly this group of people. They are paying 50% or more of the income toward housing. And the rationale to categorize them as rent burden is because they have to forgo essential things, food, Medicare, medical services, medicine, transportation, in order to make the rent payment. So we work with about 700 families a year and more than half of them has self-disclosed when they enter into the program working with us. Either they are currently homeless, couch serving, or on the street, or they have received notice to quit at risk of becoming homeless. So that's a very serious problem. So we know families, they know how to spend their money best. So when we give this $400 to them, we have a string attached. It's not a string free. So they have to come to our office on a weekly basis. We give them an hour solid case management time and we have 10 benefits programs that we help them apply. And these programs ranging from SNAP benefits, free cell phone, utility discount, internet discount, all the way down to RAFT or child tax credit application or earn income tax credit application. So we estimated a family of two, just the application for food stamp SNAP, we can net them in the course of a year about $6,500 just through the act of our caseworker helping a family of two. One of the 10 benefit programs, we can help them net over $6,000. So in our calculation, we can help boost families, their income up to $27,000 just by going through this motion of applying to everything that they're eligible for. So. If we have 12 families, that's what our CPA proposal is for. Instead of providing vouchers to six families, we want to help 12 families. Why? We have 25 families on the wait list. And so far, we are only able to serve 17 families. And every family has a success story they can share. And among them, I want to highlight when they stay with this program, during the time they are in the program, every, every one of them, 100% of them stay housed. Nobody has lost their housing and onto the street. That's one very good accomplishment. And the others, such as 94% of them, they are working. We help them find jobs with their income. And that's why they can stay housed. I will not go into other accomplishments they have made, but by your support of the CVBG support service, because without the support service, 
the $400 you give them, it's not going to help them achieve the long-term permanent affordable housing and secure a financial self-sufficiency. Those are our two goals. When we attach the support service to the voucher, that completes the circle. So the money is provided. I'm asking for the team of social workers, our caseworkers to work with them. And this is 12 families and we work with them one at a time every week. So that's our promise to continue the program. Thank you, Wei Ling. That's like uh, definitely a program that's done great work. And I would just like to ask if, while Wei Ling is still here, if anyone has any questions about this program that they would like to ask before she leaves. You know, I just, I guess I, I think it's pertinent for me to disclose, I am one beneficiary of the, of the rental assistance. And so I just, I don't know if I should abstain, but I do benefit from this. And I just wanted to tell people that. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's good. That's great. I don't know if you should abstain either. I, I mean, you're a, you're a living example of how that it works. So, hey, <laughs> um, yeah, does anybody I mean, have anything else, anything else anybody needs to say? Oh, so, I mean, actually, I think, you know, we're, the trust might just, um, vote to write a general letter of recommendation. And so I think that's fine if you vote, if it was something a little bit more concrete regarding Amherst Community Connections, then I would you know, probably recommend you abstain just because um, <clears throat> you know, the situ you know, just your relationship with them, but I think it's fine what we're doing tonight. Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, Erica. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I had a question that um, it says that this is a you're seeking a three year three year grant, but but does CPA do that? Do they give three year grants or? May I answer the question? Please do. Thank you. Um, the CPA does provide three year grant, and I can give you two of our past grants. One is the Housing First Phase One. It was a three year grant, and Phase Two also was a three-year grant. And further, we applied for a third phase of Housing First grant. We got it. And not only we got it, we were increased to six vouchers. But because of our internal capacity, our agency had to decline that phase two, three-year grant funding. So there is a precedent. There are precedents here that we have received three three-year funding from CPA. Thanks. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, anything else? Well, my question is, um, so our families, the time is for them to be on the subsidy for three years? No. We want them to be out as fast as we could get them out. That way we can serve more people. So we uh, want to set a goal of no more than one year based on our experience because of the pandemic in the past two plus years, in general, our families have stayed with us through the thick and thin of COVID-19. So between the individual or family household, they just have individuals and the families, their time changes. So for the family, we give them on average, so far based on our statistics is about 18 months long. But for the individuals, it takes less time to achieve the progress of sustainability in their income and affordable housing achievement. And they take about half the time. So the more we can graduate them, the faster we do it, the more people we can take into the program. Thank you. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. So I I don't know, does someone want to suggest, I don't know if we need an exact actual pr proposal, but does someone want to suggest that we support this proposal? I believe that at the end of this, what we'll do is write some kind of a letter that states what our, our support for whatever it is that we're supporting, conglomerate of whatever the things are that we support. Or so, Carol, I think 
sorry to interrupt, but we could just have review every proposal and then just talk about them, you know, in context of each other, just. Okay, and then to decide. To okay. Yeah. okay. All right. <clears throat> well then, Wayne, thank you very much for being here. And I'm not really seeing anybody from either of the other organizations here. So. Uh, All right, well, thank you. Thank you for being here. So Wayfinders, I presume people have had some chance to look at it. There is a, it's a 70 unit proposal. They're asking for $1.8 million. They've already received the $735,000 that it cost to buy the property from the town. The town bought the property. Um, it's a 30, if you add in the, the price of the land back in, it's over a $31, 000, $31 million project to build the 70 units on Belcher Town Road and at East Street. And I probably, we all saw, you know, or I believe we all saw their proposal at the forum. So is there a further discussion? Are there thoughts? Is there anything anybody thinks to say about this proposal? Okay. Moving right along then, <clears throat> uh, we have the Ball Lane proposal, the other one from Valley CDC. Their proposal to the CPAC is for $750,000. They're doing a 30 unit afford uh, home ownership project. 20 of those units will be affordable and 10 will be market rate. And there's a there's a breakdown like that for Wayfinders, which I can't quite remember how many of them are affordable. A few of them are not, but most of them are. Um, they're asking for $750,000 from CPAC and built already into their uh, the sources and uses things that they showed in their proposal was, I guess, in anticipation of asking also the housing trust for another $250,000. <clears> so that's where that is. Again, we saw the presentation, Jessica Allen presented this to us last time, I think at our last meeting. Uh, so I don't know, was there any, any discussion about this particular proposal? And then we can talk about all of them together. I had one question on the on the ball lane and that was just, I noticed that they talked about revenue coming from selling the house that's on the land and I didn't quite understand what that was about. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, I think it's over eight acres and there's an existing house. So there might actually be two and there's one house. It's actually at the end of ball lane. Um, it's not kind of on the open property and there's a current tenant that lives there uh, and they would actually may want to stay in the house. And so they were considering trying to sell it to the person who's living there. Um, so that, that was what that is. Um, and that wouldn't touch any of the development or it's No, they're gonna to try to create its own parcel or separate okay. area that the house the house could be, you know, <clears throat> not included with any of this. Okay. Whether it's yeah. Thanks. But and also, so the ball lane, um, people are asking for two hundred and fifty thousand out of our basically three hundred thousand or so that we have. That's like most of it, right? Yeah, well, they haven't I'm, requested it yet, but in their budget, right. they show that they will be requesting that from the uh, trust. And the Wayfinders people are request are they requesting anything out of that three hundred thousand? They um, have not said, at least I don't think, Nate. I don't. I didn't see that it said in there anything they were going to request from the housing. No, trust. I haven't either. Um, <clears throat> One can but never tell what will happen in the future, and and uh, and Valley hasn't asked for it yet, but it is in their their sort of pro forma budget that they presented. There is that two hundred fifty thousand dollars there. Of course, we have right now whatever that is three hundred thousand dollars, as you mentioned, three hundred plus. We also have in, have submitted our own proposal to CPAC for five hundred thousand dollars. So. If we get that, then maybe 
you know, I don't know, it's a dance, but our, the purpose for, of, all this, of all of the funding that we have anyway is development, but you're right. They are uh, thinking of asking for a significant piece of money from us as well. But can we be basically for the ball lane development, even if eventually we come back and say, they either can't have all of the, the 50,000 or they, or they can't have that. And we could still be for the basic idea of polling. Absolutely, absolutely. We can say, I mean, we, in a letter that we write, we can voice, I would expect that we would voice support for all of these projects. It's so great that they're all coming. We need them desperately. We're glad to see them all happening and see developers engaged in doing this stuff and working with the town to do it. And I am probably, and then we can talk about whether we want to say, we could leave it right there and let CPAC wrestle with whatever they have to wrestle with about how much anything is. If we think there's something that we want to say about the amounts we can say that. So it's kind of, this is our chance to discuss what we might want to say beyond what I just said, which I don't think anybody would disagree with, but please holler at me if I'm saying something you don't agree with. I mean, we, these, are, these are projects that we are so glad to see getting into the pipeline. We need all of this kind of housing very much. Yeah, and, I mean, quickly, I think the CPA process, you know, the committee might take another, um, two to three months to make their recommendations. And so the trust may have another meeting where these could be discussed. <clears throat> you know, just those housing proposals alone are, you know, three times the amount of available funding in the CPA pool this year. And there's, you know, actually like five times as much money requested as is available. So, you know, I don't think it's actually feasible to fund all these requests at their proposals at what they're requesting. And okay. so, you know, does the trust want to recommend funding some at less or do we take a more kind of general approach as Erica mentioned to say that these are all really great projects. You know it's important to uh, show the local support through CPA funding and really then it's the trust. Um, you know the CPA committee may come back to the trust and say well, what do you think, but maybe initially we could keep it more general. Um, you know I, I do think that wayfinders proposal, you know it'd be the largest request ever of CPA if awarded. Uh, Valley is asking a lot for Ball Lane at 750. I mean, in their proposals, they say it's less than 40,000 a unit. That's true, but when you're providing a lot more units, it's just the total cost is really high. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, like I said, there's a lot of proposals this year for CPA more than in the past. So I think it's a very competitive cycle. And I think that the CPA committee also asks, how, what are you leveraging for other funds? And so, I think Valley's just coming right out and saying, well, we're going to ask the trust. They also have requested ARPA funding. Uh, Wayfinders hasn't yet, um, but they might. And so, you know, my guess is if Wayfinders really wants 1.8 million from, say, like non-state or federal sources, whether it be local or fundraising, or whatever, if the CPA committee only recommends a million, they might come to the trust for half a million, and then they're going to try to fundraise or find another 300,000 outside their, you know, their typical financing. Um, Valley has claimed, and I think they're right that they would know better, I don't know, but the program they're doing is the only subsidy program. So, you know, like Wayfinders applies to the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and, you know, it's a big rental project, and there's other sources of funding. It's, you know, it's really competitive, but Valley as a home ownership project, there's very limited subsidy programs out there for them. And so, you know, there's really only like one or two, um, and so, you know, I think that's why they're asking for a fair amount. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think I agree with Carol. I think they're really all great proposals. You know, and we funded Waylings um, previously, for instance, the uh, CPA committee may say, well, we're not going to recommend three years because it's a big budget. We're going to recommend two this year. Right. And then they just reduce the amount, prorate the amount or something. I mean, there's going to have to be decisions made on every proposal. There's just no way to fund everything that's being asked. You know, the historic preservation proposals, the recreation proposals. I mean, it's just, it, you know, it totals many millions of dollars. And so, you know, I, I, in, you know, I, I just think it's going to put um, the CPA committee in a tough position. And they might ask applicants, you know, what's the bare minimum? What's the least amount you need? Or could you come back next year? Or, you know, I just think, um, I think for Valley and Wayfinders at least, 
Um, they're trying to go through permitting in the winter spring and apply for funding next summer. And they would like the local match uh, available at that time because then it makes their application more competitive. And so although they submitted a CPA proposal now, the funding isn't available until next July. That's true for everyone. But you know, they can't they can't really wait a year because that could you know delay their application. They really like the state and others really want to see a local match and permitting at time of funding application. So, you know, that's why they're, you know, they're they're putting in something now, even though the projects aren't guaranteed. Yeah, and one thing that Nate reminded me of when we were talking before the meeting started, uh, the CPA committee can, the town council has to approve all this at the end of it all, but the CPA committee can propose to bond something, which is the only way that they can kind of agree to spend more money than they have by getting a bond for it, then they only have to pay the bond, the you know, the whatever it is, the the monthly amount, it's like a mortgage. So they only have to pay the yearly amount each year. And then they have a debt service, which they have to continue to pay, obviously, until the debt is done. And that spreads the cost over some years, but also means that in the future years, the amount they have available is less than they might otherwise, because they have increased the amount of debt service that they have to carry. So they have a lot of hard things to figure out to even make their proposal to town council. And then town council has to agree with whatever they propose. So there's a long ways down this road to go. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess I'm interested in what, what people's thoughts are about how we should proceed at this moment right now with these requests for support. Any opinions welcome or questions or confusions or anything, please speak. <clears throat> like the idea of recommending all three of them, um, you know, to go forward with a letter from us and then wait to see how much they request then from, uh, from, from us. And then we can discuss it then. I think they're all three of them great proposals. And like you said, we should be supporting, you know, these types of projects and, uh, that's that would be my my suggestion and vote. I, Thanks, I, agree. I agree that supporting all of them, I, I guess I'm just I'm less enthused about the least amount of units that cost the most. And it sounds like ball lane just because it's ownership and um, they're going to cost a lot and have a like a, a fairly low percentage of affordable units, right? Like. What's the percentage of affordable units on the, the ball lane? Uh, 20 of 30. I believe oh, that's okay. right. If somebody else, if somebody remembers differently, please. I think there's 30 units, 20 will be affordable <coughs> and 10 will be market rate, whatever that exactly means. Yeah, no, that's, well, that's, that's, good. That's, good. <coughs> that's good. They're just kind of expensive townhouses, more or less. I mean, they but you own be. it. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you get some kind of ownership benefit. D Nate, do you remember? Yeah. I think there are some affordable out of the 70, too. I mean, some that are market rate out of the 70. Do you remember that number? I don't remember it offhand. I mean, for Wayfinders? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Wayfinders will only have, you know, 45 affordable and then 25 market rate. So, you know, they're balancing affordable and market rate as well. Wow, it's that high. I forgot. Only 45 are affordable and 25 aren't. So that's like a lower percentage, I think, well, than, than the ball lane. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, actually, I agree. I, the only thing I will say is home ownership is an expensive program. Um, you know, so we haven't, the town hasn't really had a, many affordable home ownership developments, right? They're all rental. And so, you know, um, Valley is taking, kind of a you know step here because North Amherst is a qualified census tract so it's eligible for this uh, Commonwealth Builders program you know it's trying to get um, equity into you know into homeowners and so I think it's a unique opportunity um, you know I just it's interesting um, to you know when you do comparisons of cost to units or number of affordable to overall right there is a difference and home ownership is typically more expensive um, but I still think it's a, you know, it's a great project. It's, it's really hard to, um, 
sometimes it's hard to make that comparison. And, you know, the, uh, you know, at one point the trust said we wouldn't want to spend more than I think in our guidance document was it RFP like 50,000 or up to a hundred thousand in, in, in rare circumstances per unit. But, um, you know, it, yeah, I mean, we're not, we wouldn't be offering that much. It's still less, I guess at around 40, but, um, typically when Habitat develops a house, we've been providing 50 to 80,000 a unit between usually the towns involved with the land acquisition and then with, you know, direct support to Habitat for the construction. So it is just a more expensive program. Yeah. There's less subsidy. Want, you know, it's subsidy. To, to take that into account that, I mean, maybe there's a real push for many people to want to own something. It, I just think it's, you get a lot more people in. Well, I mean, maybe not percentage wise, but 45 families helping versus 20, 20 families that can own something. Eh, I mean, apples and oranges maybe, but just to consider what really helps more people. Partly it's the partly it's the size of the, I mean, I don't think you could put 45 affordable units in the ball lane place anyway. I mean, it's like very different kinds of circumstances and different kinds of, I look at uh, 132 Northampton Road is, what is it, 20 something, 20 something units, I think. And that's kind of the, the what the size of the place. And so there's just a lot of variety and at least in my opinion, I, the variety is good. I, I like the fact that there are all these different kinds of things coming up, different possible ways to live. But yeah. <clears throat> well, I want a tiny house um, plot of <laughs> land. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is you can fit a hundred tiny houses. I went by Ball Lane. You could fit a hundred tiny houses on Ball Lane, in my opinion, but not that I measured anything, but it's like, <laughs> You know, people like tiny houses <laughs> too, you know? Yeah, that's a good, that is a uh, thought and a thing that I personally would like to see more of somehow incorporated, but I don't know how to do it either, actually, but yeah. Um, anybody have anything else? Just a, a question on, sort of how useful our support letters are. I mean, what, you know, in the decision that, that Nate sort of laid out in terms of, do we state any preferences or just sort of give blanket approve, you know, support. And then if they have questions, they can come back to us. I just, I, I'm wondering sort of the weight of our opinions and, and how much debate should go into this. I'm gonna yeah. ask Nate to answer that. <laughs> I think that's a, no, that's a really good question. I think for now, um, you know, it's so early in the process that I'm not even sure the CPA committee's met to review proposals. And so I think something just more general, but I, I do think, uh, especially in, you know, for this round, at some point the trust may want to, you know, put a preference in or priority or say, you know, these are the two housing proposals we think that should go forward or, you know, at this amount, you know, it, in the past, the town boards and committees have, you know, put a priority ranking and funding amount, but it's somewhat odd because the trust also asked for funding. And so we stopped doing that because it's seems somewhat inconsistent or, you know, arbitrary that we would recommend, you know, our proposal first always, <laughs> uh, but no. So I think, um, you know, for this round in particular, just because of the size of the requests and the, you know, there's not enough funding to go around, I think, the trust may want to come back to this and say, okay, you know, Valley, we think this much, Wayfinder is this much, and the reasons why. And, I, you know, in terms of the way the CPA committee is a committee of representatives with a few at large, right? So there's someone from the Housing Authority, Conservation Commission, Recreation Commission. Um, and I think sometimes they look for guidance. And so, you know, they may ask actually from the trust or from town staff. Um, but for right now, I think it can be more general. Yeah, I think I, I feel at least I feel comfortable with writing something that says these are great proposals. We certainly support them um, and in some generic kind of way and kind of not be surprised if they come back and ask us more. But um, yeah. Yeah. When, uh... Erica, Carol, and I were talking before the meeting. I said, right, sometimes 
the CPA committee likes to fund a project and not necessarily have them come back the following year. But knowing that, you know, the way these could be funded and uh, cost of everything, you, you know, the trust, for instance, could say, let's fund these at this amount with the expectation that they would come back in the next year or two and ask for more. And, you know, we would, you know, we would consider that or something, or, you know, just, you know, I think it's difficult. Um, say, for instance, they said, oh, let's fund Wayfinders at 1.8 million. That's, that's more money than they have this year. And then it would also require our borrowing half a million. That means every other proposal wouldn't get funded at all. And so it's just, you know, it's, I, you know, unless the trust feels really strongly that that one proposal should get all the money, um, you know, I think we can wait to have kind of that conversation. Cause I, you know, I don't even know all the proposals that were submitted for all the other categories. And so, um, you know, there could be like a really great historic preservation project that, you know, you know, might, you know, not that the trust yeah. would necessarily recommend that over housing, but, you know, it may be something that could get funded or a recreation project. So, um, yeah, the, on the Nate said that on the website at some point on the CPA website, there'll be the proposals for the current year. Right now, the only thing up there is the ones from previous years and a way to send one in. But you, we can't really look at what other proposals there are. We know of these four because the three are the, at least two of them, the way, Wayfinders and uh, Ball Lane are projects that we're interested in and supportive of. And we've been always supportive frequently at least supportive of Amherst Community Connections proposals and our own proposal. So that's what we know about. We don't really, except for whatever Nate might know by hearsay, we don't know what the other proposals even are at this point. Um, so, so yeah, so I guess let me ask, is it is it acceptable to people that I and with Erica's help will draft some kind of a letter of support and will, well, I don't know how fast we have to submit it. If we need to submit it, Nate, do you know how fast we need to submit it? No, I'm on the. Am I muted? I know I'm not muted. I'm I'm on the CPA committee webpage right now. At first, they had kind of looked like a a quick timeline, but I think you know in the next two weeks, you know the the trust says it's good for the co chairs and staff. We could write a memo, um, and you know we could send it to trust members, or we could just look at it at the next meeting. Um, it says that they, what the meeting, the CPAC, the CPAC meeting that I went to to learn about this procedure, they said they will have questions to us by October 28th and need answers by November 4th. Yeah. So we're going to have to answer at least their questions about our proposal between now and our next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we'll do that one way or the other. <laughs> And and so maybe they want, you don't think we need to have things in before they're asking questions, Nate? No. A letter? No, uh, no, I think, you know, we could say by like November 1st. You know, first week in November, I think would be a good time. Okay, so we will have a letter. In an open meeting law, um, could we draft a letter and send it to the entire trust and tell them only to respond to us or you with any comments? Yeah, we can do that. You, just... and then if you collect the comments and give them to probably, I will be mainly drafting it and getting it to Erica. Yeah. Does that work? So, so by sometime before November, shortly before November 1st, at least, I will have something to everyone. Mm -hmm. And Nate will get any of your comments back to me. But so we should have the letter ready to go on November 1st. So we'll try to have everything. Also getting it out, getting any comments to Nate, Nate telling me what happened to happen before November 1st. Yeah, I mean, if Carol, if you could draft something by next Friday, the 21st, we, I could send it out. We could get any other individual comments by the 28th or 27th. And then I can get all those together and send them to you. Um, okay. I will draft something for you by Friday, next, by a week from tomorrow, right? If that, yeah. if that, if, you know, if that schedule works, for instance, I was just looking at the calendar. Well, that works because actually I'll be out of town the following week. So that's a good schedule. <laughs> okay. I think it would also work, Nate, if you gave us a copy of the one that was sent prior. I think you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, um, yeah, that'd, that'd be helpful. See yeah. what we've ever done in the past. Sure. Great. 
Okay, well, I think that we can move on then to our next topic. Thank you. To which I will right. turn it over to Erica. <laughs> Thank you. So we just wanted to give uh, an update on the forum. It seems so long ago, uh, it was on September 13th, um, that we had a public forum for um, the Wayfinder project, um, which is the East Street in the Peltertown Road. Um, and what we did is um, we did a presentation and sort of um, laid the ground for why affordable housing is so important. Um, and then Wayfinder stepped in and talked specifically about who they were, um, generally what they have done and what their experience is, and then they presented their design. Um, and after uh, the presentation, we had two speakers. Um, one um, was from Olympia Oaks, who I think was very moving in terms of her experience um, and the positive impact of having affordable housing. And the um, other speaker was from the Family Outreach of Amherst in terms of the work that they've been doing and the challenges that they've had in terms of housing individuals and how affordable housing has is really um, an opportunity to help individuals and families here in Amherst um, and to also um, meet the needs uh, of very diverse individuals uh, here in the community. Um, I know that Rob was there, Ashley was there, and um, I think that, oh, Allegra was also there. Um, so. Um, we were all there, and so um, there were, I believe there were about a little bit more than 30 people who attended. We had sort of hoped to have 60, um, but I think this was just the beginning. Um, we were also prepared if there were any sort of um, uh, negative feedback, but we didn't get any. We really got very good questions around the design, um, you know, around timelines. Um, I thought it was very supportive. Um, we also agreed that this would be sort of the beginning of a conversation. Um, you know, so this was the first uh, community meeting to present um, the design, the, the initiative, and that we would have, um, have other follow-up meetings with this, uh, you know, post this and maybe even in person. Um, so um, I, I thought it went very, very well. It was very successful. I thought the dialogue went really well. It was over an hour and a half. Um, as I remember it, um, it really, we answered all the questions. Uh, we were prepared, you know, if there were, if, you know, there were too many questions that we couldn't answer, uh, we were prepared to take those and, and possibly um, provide answers later, but we were able to answer all the questions. Um, so I thought it was a really uh, good dialogue, but I will just um, invite Rob and um, Ashley to um, chime in. And I know, Risha, you spoke to John uh, in terms of his opinion of how it went, so. Go ahead, Ashley. Sorry, you know what? A, like a phone call came in and it made it mute for a second. I didn't oh. get the <laughs> couple seconds. Sorry about that, sorry. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything about the forum, um, anything else that you wanted to share regarding the forum. Oh, well, I thought it was very interesting and very informative and also, um, I don't remember her name, but she did speak quite um, eloquently about her troubles with the barriers and with the, um, you know, I think she had a daughter who was um, facing uh, eviction and she was having a very, very hard time getting her into new housing. And um, I, think, I think it's important to address some of those things, but then also, um, you know, building new things is important. But the other part is getting the people into the new buildings. And so it's like, I think we need to focus some on the barriers and making it easier. And um, it is, it, there's just very little affordable housing in the Amherst area or Western Mass. Like it is hard to find, it takes months and months to get into it and you might be denied even after those months. And that's, you know, I feel for her. I know what it took. To get my tax credit apartment and it was a rigmarole and I have a lot of access to um, you know resources and computers and self advocacy and not everybody has that. I'd say one fact is that we asked people to give us their emails and so there were at least eight or nine new email uh, contacts that we got that I've now put on the list of where we send all the 
all the information about the trust out to now eight or nine more people than we were before the forum. Who, who manages that list? Because in my promotion of the event, I got a few as well that wanted to be added. Um, I, I, ha I have the list. If you send them to me, I can add. I seem to be managing the list by some kind of default. So I will continue to do that unless somebody else wants to take it over. That would be fine, too. I thought it was run out of the community, wasn't actually run out of the trust. John's group? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a list that John gave us that I have now min taken a few people off because they kept bouncing, added a few people to that he sent out. I'm sure he sent it to the housing advocacy group, but he also would every time before a housing trust meeting send out an announcement about the housing trust, about these meetings to this group of people also. And so, uh, so we've continued, I've continued to do that. And that's the list that I'm working from. The list that he had yeah the trust we don't you know staff right we don't maintain the rolodex at one point we tried and it's just it's too much and really we you know then people rely on the town or the board or committee to always remind them of something and so i think it's great that carol is doing it you know it's you know i would tell people that it's not um i think the housing advocacy coalition could do it as well you know this i would say this is not you know in place of checking the, the town's website or looking for an agenda posting. But, it, you know, John kept, you know, I think he would email like 70 to 90 people every time there was a meeting. He would just have a, you know, a recurring email he just might respond to and send it. Yeah, no, I thought the forum was great. You know, the staff, we've met with Wayfinder since. Um, you know, there's a few adjacent neighbors who've had questions. There's one that may, you know, we're gonna work more with uh, that, you know, they're, you know, those properties are most impacted. Uh, they're trying to get out on site to do some things. So, um, yeah, I think there'll probably be another community meeting and then, you know, they'll submit something officially to the town. It could be two months, uh, maybe by the end of the year. And then there'll be a public comment period as well, too. There'll be 30 days for the town to respond. And so, you know, I think what they're hoping to do is have, you know, it could be one or two more. And if you have these series of meetings and um, opportunities for people to speak, then you know, you've kind of gone ahead of the game in terms of getting comments before you submit to the town and the state. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was kind of surprised actually, I was hoping for more and I, you know, I was surprised the comments were really general. You know, I, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was surprised I'm, I'm waiting for maybe more specific comments once they see some things, but I thought it was really supportive as well. So it was, it was nice. I agree. It was I thought it was very, very supportive. Um, but I also agree. I think, you know, Ashley and Risha had mentioned that we we should probably do one in person and possibly work with the schools, uh, the school uh, in the area to do in person. So I think it's something that we should uh, work with Wayfinder on. Um, but I, I, I did think it was very positive and I thought the dialogue and the comments and the insights were really positive. So was good. And I think, you know, uh, what you mentioned, Ashley, that um, the individual who talked about their, um, their child, uh, adult child, and all the challenges um, also demonstrated the immediate need versus the long term need. Um, and so that's why it's so important, thinking back in terms of the forum and thinking back in terms of our CPA proposals that we just talked about, there really does need to be sort of a multi prong approach in terms of immediate support to families and individuals. Uh, rental support and home ownership, because I think that's just so critical um, in terms of our goals. Um, and so I just also wanted to just mention and thank uh, Representative Dom was also at the uh, at the forum, and she's always at each event supporting us and affordable housing. So I just wanted to thank her also for being there. Um, Rob, I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to share from the forum. No, nothing to add. It was it was very well done. I thought. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, I'd like to just, you know, right, I, I underscore what Ashley said is, you know, I, I meant to call Francine after the next day and say thank you because, you know, it, right, you forget how important, um, you know, some, you know, certain services are, right? So everyone's like the housing piece, great, but, you know, it's hard just to even apply for it and then maybe stay in it. And so, um, you know, and I don't think people realize that, that you could, you know, have an incomplete application and, yeah, you know, I think Wayfinders is, will work with an applicant, but you know others may not as well, and so it, it's a whole process just to apply. And um, 
you know, I, I think that's great. It's kind of like when my daughter was born, she was in the hospital and everyone's like, the surgeons think they're rock stars. They're going to say she's great, but uh, the nurses are the ones who know everything and they're going to tell you otherwise. And so it was really funny. So then the next day the surgeon comes in and is like, she's great. She can go home the next day. And the nurses are just like, no, but <laughs> they, they, they want to see the progress and they don't, <laughs> they don't, they don't want to do the actual care. Not I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm generalizing here, but it was funny to hear someone say that. And then, um, so I feel like, you know, people don't mention family outreach or Amherst community connections or others, but that's so important to keeping housing and getting in housing. And it's kind of the intangibles. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, you know, when I heard the person speak, it's like, how do we address that? Some of it's bigger than just the development. It's like, you know, statewide, can we have a better application process or can we, you know, how do we change a, a broader macro level thing. Um, Cause you know, I think, I think people would do it if it was available. Uh, is, have, have we ever, and is it possible to do sort of more of a listening? Like, I was thinking about the ball lane barbecue and I liked that idea because it, it is more informal than a forum mm -hmm. um, and, and gets people there for reasons that aren't about ball lane you know development but then they also hear about that i mean is it is it something a group like us can do to show up or host a community more of an event neighborhood event and and listen to people or is it just there's no way around the the open meeting that we would inevitably talk about something and no i think we could be creative i mean we'd have to post it as a public meeting <laughs> Uh, that doesn't mean it, it'd have to be in an accessible location and a few, you know, we'd have to have a few, meet a few kind of thresholds. But, um, you know, we, I think like Eric was saying, having something at the schools, we've done that before for other projects where, you know, it's, you know, that usually ends up having, um, you know, good attendance, uh, you know, especially if there's some opportunity to have a place where kids can be, or if you have, you know, food or something. And so, um, you know, we could think about that if we needed to for this you know, for what, for some of the projects. I mean, the, when Valley had their barbecue, they went to district one. So it wasn't Valley's thing. It was, you know, district one had a neighborhood meeting and they attended. And so I was thinking, you know, right. Is it possible to have some other, you know, could we piggyback on or take advantage of some other type of meeting or venue, and then have this be something where we get comments. So, um, you know, it may, it may be, it's interesting. I'm, you know, we've let a lot of neighbors know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm expecting we'll hear more comments, but maybe, you know, maybe quiet is good. Maybe it means they support it. And so they're not, they just don't feel the need to come out. Um, yeah. But. And I don't even mean this, you know, the specific development, but just in general, if, if people are so struck by hearing someone's experience with it, maybe it means we all need to hear about more experiences and, and so that we can focus our energy where it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, I went to that um, District 1 potluck. It was in the Mill River um, Park. I don't, I mean, can we have a affordable housing trust fund potluck once a year just to, it, I mean, maybe it doesn't have to be like a formal meeting or it could be, but just to have it be like, we're out in the community at least once per year in the park. Like that's an Amherst park. I mean, can't we just get the little pavilion and have a little potluck? Yeah, I, I think we could. I mean, I want to, right. I think, like I said, we might have to post it as a public meeting, but that doesn't mean we can't then have it be a potluck, right? We would just say there's a public meeting of the trust at Mill River Pavilion <laughs> from seven to nine. And, you know, it's just kind of, um, you know, just a more broad general agenda. So yeah, I, I don't, you know, I think we could do something like that. Well, maybe something to shoot for in the spring or something at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then also, I mean, ultimately, are we going to meet in person? I mean, people are meeting in person. <laughs> I go places, like, do things. Don't, don't you guys have jobs? Like, people are meeting in per person. So I think we should meet in person somewhere. It's a t I think it's a town decision about meetings at present. I mean, we were meeting in person and were required to meet in person before the pandemic. And now the town is doing what it needs to do in order to meet state requirements and its own technology issues and stuff. 
I believe that at some point the town will say, okay, you should meet in person, but it hasn't happened yet, at least for our regular meetings. Um, well, Nate, I mean, do other committees meet like town no, council? No, it's all, all remote until next year, till April. Um, oh. And so that's the recommendation is, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say it's like a mandate, but it's going to stay remote. Uh, and then, you know, the state may, um, may or may not, you know, allow remote meetings after that, but we'll be remoting, meeting remotely for the next few months. Um, so, I, you know, I actually think it's pretty efficient um, from my, my perspective for a lot of reasons, but the, um, you know, if we do go back to in-person, the difficulty is um, to have like a hybrid meeting where it could also be remote and in-person is very difficult. So it's almost easier to be one or the other. Uh, and I think so that's a big decision, but, you know, if we are allowed to meet in person, you know, the planning board had said, oh, it'd be great. And I said, well, maybe like once a quarter, right, or, or right, at some point you could have in-person meetings. Maybe it's not every meeting, but you could have, you know, some schedule where most are remote and then you can meet in person or you can have events in person. And so, but for up until, you know, for the next few months, it's really going to be remote. Um, you know, we, that was asked actually just recently and the, that the answer was to continue meet, to meet remotely. So I just want to recap because I think there um, were a couple of ideas thrown out here. One um, is in terms of the Wayfinders project, if someone else were to invite them, um, such as District 1 um, that, they, that uh, Valley went to, and they actually had a wonderful uh, presentation and little modular uh, designs that people can just look around and talk to people. It was really wonderful way to just have conversations with the architects and the designers and, and really think about what it is that they were doing and be able to see um, the model on the table and, and see how it's going to sort of be displayed and, and their ideas and also the different types of houses around um, the country as well as Canada. So when you looked at the pictures of uh, houses that were already developed, they were beautiful places. They were absolutely beautiful places. So, so one is that, you know, a, different organizations could invite them in and we can go as well. Um, the other is, it sounds to me like possibly listening sessions where we sponsor an open meeting and invite people to come and we listen to whatever people want to um, share with us um, to better understand you know, the different needs uh, around housing and being housed here in, in Amherst. Um, and then I think the third thing was, is that we eventually have a meeting together um, in the spring or whenever um, the town decides that it's safe for us to all be in the same space. So I just don't want to lose any of that. Um, but if we were to do listening sessions that included potlucks, et cetera, um, we would have to have people organizing it. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it does take organization. It takes publicity. It takes uh, making sure that we have a venue. So it's, it's, it's it's time that people have to commit to and investing in doing that, but it sounds like something that we might do in the spring. So um, let's keep that open. Let's keep that on the agenda. All right, um, discussion. So the next one, um, this was actually raised by one of our um, members and um, it sort of uh, came about when the conversation was that um, immigrants were being flown from Texas to Martha's Vineyard and Amherst and Northampton were also sort of put out in the list of that um, immigrants were just gonna be flown and, and dropped off inhumanely in a town um, without any supports or without, without any, much warning. And so the conversation was, well, you know, if something like that were to happen, um, how can we as a trust be supportive around the housing that there might be some housing needs? And so when Carol and I talked about having this conversation, um, I said, yes, that's definitely one scenario, but another scenario could be knock on wood, hopefully never happens. But what if we had an earthquake and half the town needs housing very quickly, or you know, there was some sort of disaster, fire, et cetera. Um, is there any mechanism that our trust could quickly provide some funding to whoever steps in to house people because of a disaster or an emergency or a crisis? And um, we don't know if there is or not, or that possibility, but we had thought maybe we should think about, um, and so this, this was just a brainstorming and, and then including you in the brainstorm, um, should we have some sort of protocol or procedure 
which could either include um, having an emergency meeting of the housing trust members around the situation to think about, you know, could we contribute a certain amount of money just to quickly support whatever intervention there was to house people in an emergency? Um, or, you know, would the um, protocol or recommendation be that the two chairs could designate maybe $5,000 or $10,000 are um, from our trust, um, that's not CPA funds, um, to support something like this. Um, so we wanted to put it out here to the group in thinking about, um, one, is it necessary? Two, is it possible? And three, what would it look like? Um, and we'd start a conversation here, but if maybe somebody would volunteer, uh, if we think it's necessary, and we think we should do something like this, if someone would volunteer to actually put something together and bring it back to um, our next meeting, to present to the group in terms of thinking about that's the type of protocol we could put into place. Yeah, also, I, I would like to suggest, um, like, maybe we could just also ask kind of like our partners, because um, I did ask John about this one time, two things, Craig's door, because of one time I had called for a friend who it was needing a place, it last I knew, which just maybe a month ago, it had a wait list of like 50 to 100 people. And I'm sure that if they had more funds, they would get more hotel rooms, probably. I mean, I would hope so. Maybe they have a proposal like for their, because they're probably more like on the ground with like, you know, disaster, people have fires, people have floods in their own apartments and then become homeless overnight, just like, you know, one family. What if they know of people who are coming to them with, emergency things and so and then also i mean hopefully we won't have any immigrants just um dropped off but there are people that place migrants in places and maybe they would have a proposal for when an emergency happened they're already kind of like one is called jewish family services i think and it like they probably already know kind of like before us maybe what's happening and maybe they need the funds. So maybe we could, the proposal could be like putting out to several agencies, including Craig's door. If you have an emergency, this is like your application that we would look at quickly because it's an emergency. And then we would see how much we could fund that. But yeah, I had read, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nate, probably you'd know more about this, that when we had the hoax, hoax uh, phone call, that some of these conversations started taking place, right? Um, that uh, some people started talking about how to go about, what if these uh, immigrants were to show up on our doorstep? Do you know how far those conversations got? And, and did did the town develop a plan based on that? Because I had heard that there was going to be the case where people are like, okay, this was for us to come up with some some plan to uh, to put into into play if something like this was to happen. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't too involved with those conversations. I mean, I think um, you know it was mentioned that we do have ARPA funding, so you know, in the current. Uh, you know, in the current time, there's probably some ability to help, but, you know, in future years, if there's not, you know, um, certain programs available, right, um, then I do think it would, you know, I don't know, I think I like Ashley's idea. I mean, I think there's one, we, the trust can be, make itself available and respond to proposals. Um, I think the trust can always meet and allocate funding through a vote of members. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, I mean, we could try to have a meeting as long as it's a 48 hour posting, you know, we could vote to allocate funding for a um, for something without even knowing necessarily, uh, funds have to be used to support housing, affordable housing. But you know, it could be like, okay, if if we do think migrants are coming, it could be like, okay, we vote up to fifteen thousand dollars to support um, you know housing, and then you know it could be that then myself and the chairs, we could you know we could try to see what organizations, as um, Ashley said, are on the ground that may know better, and we could you know offer support that way, um, or someone could submit a, a specific proposal. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think when the town was made aware, I said, right, there were conversations and discussions about, okay, how, how, 
know, what does it mean? What's like, what, right. What is the immediate need? Um, but, you know, I think that, I, I mean, something like that almost triggers like an emergency response, you know, so we have the emergency response team from the town, you know, so like police, fire, health, you know, uh, you know, a number of different um, department heads and town staff were meeting on that uh, probably. And so, you know, some of it could have been just right, set up a, you know, temporary shelter. And then how do you go through the steps of, of it? Um, and it may be at some point that the, they would have contacted the trust to ask for funding. Um, but I'm not sure they would expect the trust to be trying to organize something on our own, right? We would be, you know, kind of helping um, and maybe trying to facilitate connections or something. Yeah, that sounds, that makes sense to me. I think it, if we can have a meeting within, like with 48 hour notice, that if there is some emergency that something happens that we think we could have some way to respond to, the thing to do is to try to have an emergency meeting, it seems to me, and see what comes of it, and go from there. And we need a quorum uh, to vote. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the trust charge or bylaw, I mean, you know, unless it's a large amount, I think it's just a quorum. It doesn't, you know, if you needed to borrow money or do some things, it's, you know, a, a super majority uh, would need to vote on it. But I, I find that unlikely. It, it feels to me like the, the right step is to just make sure that we are known to the emergency planning groups and that they know to sort of reach out if there's anything that would involve housing. Um, so I don't know if that's Nate <laughs> or, or how how we liaison with that, whatever kinds of conversations and, and scenario planning that they do. Yeah, you know, I think I know the assistant town manager, Dave Zomack, he's you know familiar with the trust and part of a team. So I think, yeah, I, I can talk to him to see if there's other ways to even just other outside organizations that aren't town related, right? Um, you know, for instance, like would the survival center know to recommend or to reach out? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming Lev might, but right, maybe we need to just. I'm on both boards, yeah. so that's me. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but right, but I think, you know, maybe we haven't ever said that, right? So is yeah. it that, you know, over the next few months or something, maybe the chairs, we, you know, we have, you know, we do reach out to organizations just to say, you know, the trust that could be a resource if needed. I mean, something um, kind of simple. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to put ourselves out there as a, you know, a relief organization, but we are, you know, I mean, the trust may have resources. So, I mean, typically um, people will call the town, um, you know, whether it's my office or finance department. I, I mean, I'm always surprised, you know, who, you know, um, we'll get calls. And so I feel like most town staff are pretty aware uh, and can, you know, help direct people. But um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I don't, you know. I just, I guess I would like to, we don't have, I don't think, a lot of money that we could do. Well, it depends on what we're trying to do, but we only have a pretty small amount. We're going to go into our financial report next, so we'll have a better idea of this. But I think we have only a fairly small amount of money that doesn't have to live by the CPA requirements. And so I would, I don't want to give false hope anywhere. I guess that's the short version of what I want to say. I, I would, I want to be able to be whatever help we can be, but I also don't want to have people thinking that we have some way some ways of helping or some resources that we don't really have that's my only reservation or a reservation so well i think we're talking about an emergency um you know a, a, an unplanned situation a, an emergency something that's just totally you know that needs a response so it seems like the town has a protocol for response I'm sure it'll it'll mobilize other uh, service providers. Um, so, for example, you know, if if um, Amherst Community, um, I'm going to get this wrong, Community Cares, um, if you know they could step in and help families, and they're willing to step in, but you know that means repurposing their staff and um, their other families that need support, and so they may need something extra, and that's a, you know it's a short term state of emergency. They may come to us, something like that. Um, so I think um, the fact that we can meet within 48 hours 
and um, that somebody can propose to us, you know, this is a, an emergency situation. It was unplanned for, um, you know, it's, it's really dire. We need a little bit of support to do X, Y, Z. I think then that's our protocol and um, the town would be aware of what's going on, I would assume, and could also then trigger saying, well, you know, we're working with this organization and, um, you know, they, they just need a little bit of support in order to get through this because of the situation. Um, you know, so I think we have two different ways of thinking about how we could sort of um, respond to an emergency situation. Okay. All right. Um, so the next is our financial report. Which Nate, you sent out something uh, later, which he's going to put on the screen there. And hopefully Nate is going to explain to us something about how we got from where, what this looked like last time to what it looks like now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so this is, you know, um, account balances as of, um, oh gosh, I say July 8th, I guess, today. is this, this is the balance, the balance, is of, it's really as of September 30th, the, um, I guess I didn't change the, the heading. Um, yeah, so the, you know, even going back to the emergency funds that, um, I agree with Carol, so the unrestricted account, you know, there's 35,000. Um, the rest, most of the C trust money are is CPA funding, but CPA funding can be used to support housing. You know, that's what we have funded with uh, Amherst Community Connections and some others. So even in an emergency situation, I think CPA funds could be used uh, if they're directed toward housing. Um, and so then, you know, there's, there's interest on earnings. So there's 52,000, you know, all CPA funding and trust, you know, it's a trust fund. So it does have earnings. Um, which we will spend from time to time and it dips, I guess. I mean, some of this might be like, it's funny money, right? It's not, we have it, but then um, it shifts with uh, the investment um, portfolio, um, just like, you know, like a retirement account, right? You have some money available, but it might, might actually decrease or increase. Uh, technical services. So, you know, the, um, over the last three years, four years, the trust has been awarded CPA funding uh, to hire consultants. And so that, that, you know, there's 37,000 available and there's 12,000 in contracts. So those contracts are, um, you know, wetlands for old farm road to see if a house could be moved there. Um, strong street, um, uh, same thing, uh, wetland and, and, uh, uh, botanist. And, um, I think there's some older, um, contracts for, uh, I think still some work on East Street School <laughs> the town is, is still hoping to do. Um, and so, you know, that those are, you know, that's 12,000 um, and then, you know, 37,000. So, you know, that that funding could be used if we needed to hire someone to, you know, look at uh, anywhere from, you know, land assessments to, you know, the feasibility of housing certain groups or, you know, a study of something. And so um, that's, you know, that's a, a pot of money that's available there. Uh, consulting services was specifically for a consultant to assist the trust. Uh, so, you know, Rita Farrell's under contract, that's the 8,900 and there's 18,000 left. And so, you know, that was a little different than technical services. Um, you know, for instance, if the trust wanted to hire an attorney to look into something or, um, you know, do some work for the trust and not necessarily say to develop housing, which technical services is kind of tied to. So uh, there's funding available there. Um, and we may need that. So say, for instance, if the trust is to acquire property, whether that's the release or an easement or something, we have to file documents at the registry. Uh, and we, you know, we need to hire an attorney to update the trust, um, some certificates and things. So, you know, that could end up being 2000, 3000, whatever, a few thousand dollars. And so you know, that's what that funding is for. Um, and the development funds, they're funds that the trust has been awarded, you know, every year the trust asks for money from CPA. So, the almost half a million that's available is, you know, funding from the last five years that the CPA committee has been, you know, that recommended in the town has voted to the trust. And so I think that's all the way through FY23. So that's the current funding that has, you know, is available right now. Uh, the 77,000 in contracts, I actually think that's still, um, it's for two things. It's for um, the rental subsidy program, emergency program. 
I think there was some money that we just kept just in case, um, you know, the program has been over for a while now, but just to make sure um, some of the reimbursement process from FEMA can take a while. So we kept some under contract there. And then some of that funding under contract is still for the purchase of um, Belchertown Road properties. The trust voted a certain amount and not all of it was used on the direct purchase, but some of it could have been used for appraisals or other things. And so the town may still need to use some money um, just to do some site assessments there. Um, so really, you know, the trust has 600,000 available. Um, you know, Ashley asked earlier though, what if Valley does come and ask for 250,000? That would come from the development funds. And so, you know, it, it would be more than half of what's available. I mean, the trust has it, um, but you know, then you'd have to consider, okay, if you, you know, if Valley and then Wayfinders both ask for 250,000, it would deplete, you know, all the development funds of the trusts. And so, you know, it sounds like a lot, but, um, you know, it may, and, you know, maybe it can't go, you know, you know, it's kind of the trust decision. How much would you award to a, a project? Um, and so, Nate, so yeah. So do you know if in the development funds is have we received what what the CPA, the last CPA grant was going to give us? It is is the money in there now? And yeah, so I, I factored I factored that into the 466. So I went through and I took the last two years and put them in there. So um I don't, you know, you know, essentially these balances won't change, right? Unless the trust gets, you know, um donations or you know, say the next round of CPA awards some money, then that development funds um, balance would increase, but otherwise, you know, there's not really, you know. I'm yeah, and it did, it did increase from last time. The other thing is, at what point do some of these things that are encumbered become unencumbered because they're not needed anymore? They don't just stay encumbered forever, do they? I mean, if you don't need the money, how does it go back into being available? Yeah, I mean, I think the technical services and consulting services, you know, it's not large amounts. Those are still pretty active. I mean, like I said, there might be like $2,000 in technical services we could um, we could liquidate. I mean, all it takes is a confirmation from staff working with accounting. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's just that, but, you know, we check with whoever was under contract and we just have to get something in writing for the development funds. Um, I thought I had said to liquidate everything, but it might just be that there's still, um, I'd have to see exactly what is needed, uh, you know, but so essentially, you know what, um, you know, to Erica's question that, or to Carol's question, 77,000 in development funds, most of that probably could become available uh, if needed, you know, because I'm not sure we're really going to put much money, more money into the emergency rental program or the Belchertown Road property. So. And the process of it becoming unencumbered is basically like you or somebody goes to the town and says, hey, we don't need this anymore. Can you change this? I mean, is that well, how, yeah. how it actually happens? Yeah, I mean, if we think that it's, you know, especially that 77,000, if we think it's not necessary, you know, I would, um, you know, I can look into it and then I can just, you know, I'd want something in writing from, if it was say that emergency program, I would just, you know, I want, I'd want to talk to the finance director and everyone to make sure that the program is closed out and that it's not, you know, that we may not, you know, for instance, it could have been, we submitted everything to be reimbursed through, um, through COVID. And I'm assuming that we've, the town's received everything, but what if payments are still pending and, you know, we don't want to close out that line because it was a trust. Right. So, you know, you know I'm yeah. just trying to understand the process at the moment. I mean, I know you want to leave it there until you don't need it anymore, right. but, but there no, is. A yeah. I mean, if you're kind of calling the question, I can look into it and I can reach back out to you, Carol and Erica as, you know, co-chairs and just say, okay, here's where it is. What do we think we should do? Um, that then, sounds you know, great. They're not, this is, I think I asked you this before and it may be a really dumb question, but the available balance is the total which includes the encumbrances, right? No. So no. the, so the avail, so the balance, the balance is like in this case, the 77 plus the 466. <clears throat> no, the balance is what's not in contract. So it's what's available now. It's what's not encumbered. So there's four hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars in the trust that is just in the bank account, right? It's not under contract or anything. So, and then there's seventy-seven thousand in contract. So really, in that development account, there's 
you know, the uh, sum of those two things. Yeah, five hundred and fifty thousand or whatever it is. Um, okay. So encumbrances plus available balances equals the total thing. Right. Okay. I thought it was the other way around last time, but no, I've no. been wrong so many times. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions or? So um, if we unencumbered certain amounts, such as the development funds, if we actually had that 77,737 and per, you know, organizations that may have uh, a need, if they came to us, um, we, we could use that funding to, to help some of those organizations, right? I mean, we, the 77,000, we had a set aside for emergency rentals. Um, it seems like there are families who constantly have emergencies that we could use that to support them or maybe even for subsidizing mortgages if we decide to do something like that, correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, I think the trust, you know, we, um, you know, with the emergency rental program, you know, we worked with um, community action and, you know, we, I think we went through a really good process to set up a application and kind of criteria. And so the trust could do that again, could, you know, we could either contract with an agency who's already doing something or the trust could come up with its own program and then, you know, fund it. So there's a few, you know, a few different ways that it could be, but right. So I think, I think most of that 77,000 could probably, you know, be turned into available balance. Um, could we also ask people like Greg's door if, um, you know, maybe they have an internal program that's like either they're getting more hotel rooms or they're helping homeless people move out somewhere. Like what if you need first, last and deposit, but you only have the first, I mean, Craig's door, do they do that kind of thing? Do they kind of like subsidize formerly homeless people moving on to the next place they're moving on to wherever that could be? They, yeah, there's, they have some housing, um, subsidy program. So I think, you know, um, right, to do some something like that, the town used to have a similar program, you know, so I think if we were to do that, there are agencies that already um, help administer something like that. And so, you know, we might want to develop our own criteria, for instance, if we're doing security deposits, the idea is maybe you'd want to get them back, right? And so, um, or maybe you're funding, you know, just uh, rental amounts and not, you know, a finder's fee. Um, which is what we were hoping to do when we did the emergency program. We tried to have, you know, landlords agree to reduce certain fees, but um, I mean, that could be possible. I just, th I think, you know, that would, I'd like to know, you know, and I would, I would not want it to be just like a one-off each time someone wants something, but if the trust thinks it's a program uh, to fund, I would, you know, say, okay, let's, let's say uh, here's the criteria, here are the parameters, and we're going to allocate 40,000 to help, um, you know, a maximum of 2000 a household or something, and we're hoping to help 25 households or whatever, right? And so I'd, I'd want to really think carefully before, you know, Craig's Doors just comes and says, we have one, we have two guests or that are now getting housing, can we can we have $10,000? And then, you know, a month later, they say, oh, we have another one. And so, you know, I'd want to be a little bit more strategic about how we spend the money, but it is something we could do, set up a program that's available like that. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't, you know, I don't want to become um, you know, I feel like the trust, I'd want to make sure, like I said, we have guidelines in place and everything just so it's a consistent uh, spending. Sure, like maybe we could ask several people, I mean, Amherst Community Connections or, or Amherst Survival Center or Craig's Door or whoever we put this out to, to see, you know, what if they needed they already have their internal programs that maybe we have parameters about too, but each person can, you know, vie for up to 10,000 or up to 20,000 or something. I mean, it could be more than one entity, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so the, you know, the trust is a public, uh, you know, it's part of town government. So if we did that, it, essentially it becomes like a, a, a competitive bid process. And so we'd have to then make an award to a program, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, but, um, you know, I, so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we could, it's just not, it's not as easy as like, oh, let's just have a rental program and we can give some money to this organization or to here, or to this person, you know, I, I, like I said, we'd have to have, um, you know, program guidelines and, 
criteria and everything. Um, but they already have, I'm just saying that they already have programs that maybe they already could tell us about. I mean, it's not like we don't have to make up the whole thing, do we? I mean, they could probably, they probably already have some kind of system that they just, they need the funding for, but they have the system. I'm gonna stop my share. Right, and so they can actually, you know, the trust has a request for a proposal document that an app, you know, an agency could complete. And that's what Valley did when they wanted some funding for Northampton Road. So Craig's Doris could complete a request for proposals to the trust and then it, you know, the trust would review that as a funding request. You know, is that something um, you know, that you know you would vote to do? So that, that's how that would work. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As opposed to you know sure. trying to set up a new program um, or something different. Yeah, just so... time and energy and money of ours. Like, it seems like if they're already doing it and they're doing it fairly well, and you kind of trust them because they've already been doing it for years, then they could just propose they need more money for the stuff they already do kind of well. Doesn't quite seem like that would be the kind of an emergency that we were talking about before, but I presume it's something that we could consider if we wanted to. <clears throat> do we wanna, are there, are there any more things about the financial report? We've thought of lots of ways to use the money, but are there more <laughs> questions about the financial report? If not, uh, Erica, do you want to do go through our usual updates? Sure. Um, so generally, our updates are from Nate or from um, the organizations that are leading the initiatives. So we'll start with Strong Street, and that would be Nate. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting tying, you know, going back to the available balances, you know, there are, you know, there's a few projects happening for affordable housing and Strong Street's one of them, right? So there's Strong Street, there's Ball Lane, there's, um, you know, Wayfinders Project, and then, you know, there could be Strong Street and Hickory Ridge and maybe Old Farm Road. And so all those projects at some point in the next year to two may request funding from the trust. And so, um, you know, that available balance could be spent pretty fast. So, so Strong Street, you know, it's moving forward. It's a little slow, but we had a botanist. We had to have some, you know, most of the site is considered rare or uh, priority habitat for rare and endangered species. And the state said, you know, we couldn't develop it. Um, but we've had um, we've had experts out there um, doing field assessments and documenting the site. And once uh, they're done, then we, we're going to apply to the state uh, program of nat natural heritage and um, and you know, have a conversation about what what can happen, and so that's kind of the first step. So, you know, I'm a. Uh, we've also met with a few property owners. Um, you know, the you know, I don't think that strong. I think Strong Street could probably end up moving forward. It it won't be a big development, right? So the site's pretty challenging. I think even if we could develop it, it might be six to twelve units. Um, you know, it'd be a small development. It's not as if it's going to support you know forty units. So. I think the due diligence, the trust, you know, we've been doing is worthwhile. Um, you know, we've had conversations like, okay, what does it mean if it is only 10 to 12 units? You know, could it be something that um, the town tries to go through permitting and then, you know, it's, ha you know, Habitat takes it on as a multi-year effort or, you know, we find someone. And so, you know, right now we really have to determine if the site can be developed. And so that's what, you know, we're, you know, probably I'm, I'm thinking in the next two months we'll know. Um, you know, we'll have met with the state a few times. And if, you know, they, if they say no, if they say you can't impact this priority habitat area, then really there's almost, um, you know, there's the one lot on Strong Street or what, there might be one or two lots on Strong Street uh, that could be developed, the rest wouldn't. And so when we talked about this months ago, you know, Rob had suggested, well, what if we sold, what if the trust, what if the town sold those as market rate lots and then the trust could take the money and then use it for another project to leverage it. And you know, that could be an option, right? So it, I'm kind of curious to see what what happens with the uh, environmental assessment, you know, and, and, and land assessments, um, you know. So I'm, I'm kind you, of optimistic. You think you might have it, you think you might actually know an answer though in a couple of months, that's cool. Well, yeah, the, the they've been out there, um, 
and they should be wrapping up their work in the next week or so, week or two. And then we'll, you know, we already have, I, I, I've been in communication with the state. So it, it just depends on how fast we can review the information and see what kind of answer they give us. Maybe I'm optimistic, but it'd be nice to know right in the winter. And then if we want to plan something, then we can start planning something in the spring. Uh, you know, otherwise we lose a year. So, but. Absolutely, that's why it's so important to have uh, projects in the pipeline. Um, so I have not spoken with Laura Baker um, in, with Valley, um, but I have driven past East Gables um, and they are uh, absolutely fast and furiously getting that up and running. Um, so I know there's lots of work being done on it um, at the same time that the streets being worked on, which I'm sure is very challenging, um, but um, they seem as far as I see, they seem to be on track for moving forward. I don't know if anybody else has any information from Valley CDC. Laura did say that when it seemed appropriate to like do something like a tour that she would let us know. I will remind her again at some point. I actually thought some of them were gonna be here tonight. So maybe something happened, I don't know. But um, I'll ask again, just remind her that, you know, we would we'd like to see it as it goes up at some point. And we've all just talked about the East Street Belchertown Road Forum. Um, I don't think there's anything new at this point. Um, so the next one is Hickory Ridge, which I have not heard anything. And I think um, we had asked Dave to come and talk to us about what are the town's plans for this. So I don't know, Nate, if you have anything, but I have been reading the Amherst Bulletin and you know there are conservation trails that are being created there. So. I'm just wondering, are things moving forward without us, with us? What's happening? Yeah, I know the town did receive a grant. It's for you know an accessible trail loop uh, in in an area that can't be developed, so it's considered you know um, riverfront or low lying area. Yeah, I don't. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm not exactly sure. I thought by now um, we would have kind of some public process, but I think the town. I know a, a meeting. I think next week about it to try to set up kind of a master plan process, and so. Um, I know some ta uh, staff have been tasked with coming up with a kind of a, um, you know, kind of some kind of methodology and, you know, kind of a whole timeline. So I still think that's going to happen in the next few months where the town may be asking a little bit more directly what they'd want to see happen on Hickory Ridge. So, you know, there was the Engage Amherst page and people could comment on it, but I think there's going to have, you know, maybe some more efforts to see what could actually happen, you know, how much land is developable and what are the uses. So yeah, stay tuned. Um, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of interest anywhere from a community center to maybe fire station to community center or senior center to housing, um, you know, to maybe even just like a, a venue for, a, you know, other things, not even like necessarily town related. So, um, you know, I think everyone's going to try to, it's a, it's a nice site. You know, it is big. It's 150 acres. Like I said, though, there's probably less than 10 acres that are uh, that could be developed. Maybe it might only be like seven or eight. Um, but so what's going to be different from what happened prior, which is um, the town did ask for recommendations and they were even like, what is it? Word bubbles were yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the same thing. Then you would tap on it so they'd be bigger and bigger so they could see where the priorities were. So how is that different from what you just mentioned that the town's going to do? Yeah, I think, you know, there's all these layers to the site. So, you know, there's 27 acres of solar, you know, that are going to be leased to a developer. There's um, this area with the accessible trail, there's, you know, 20 acres along the river that have to be under kind of wildlands um, conservation restriction as mitigation for the solar. Uh, the town is, has block rent money to try to make a trail, uh, actually an accessible like route from um, East Hadley Road through the site to Pomeroy Village. Uh, but what some of those ideas didn't have maybe was, you know, actually like a map or some more information about what, what's possible on the site. So I think you know, as the next step would be, to, like I said, I have kind of some maps or some, a little bit more information about, okay, this is the area that, you know, could be developed or could support infrastructure, or here's where maybe the recreation would go. And it would be a little bit more um, framed in terms of the, you know, the comments or feedback the town would want. So originally it was just like, oh, what do you want on Hickory Ridge? And, you know, people said anywhere from, you know, nothing to, you know, you know, I don't know. I think some people said it would be great to have like, you know, weddings and a winery there and 
you know, all, it was, I mean, it was great ideas like disc golf to like bicycle tracks to bird watching to this, this, and this. But I think the next step would be to kind of frame some of the questions more and maybe take what was already heard and say, okay, here's, you know, here are kind of the categories of things that we've heard, but let's talk now about, okay, what about the front edge on West Pomeroy? You know, here's where the clubhouse is, the parking lot. I mean, I don't know. I'm honestly, I'm just, that's my expectation. It may not happen that way. Um, but you know, that's kind of what I'm guessing is like, okay, we have a, you know, what, what can we do there? Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you for being sort of the messenger. So I'm gonna put mm -hmm. you on the spot again. Um, we also invited Dave to talk about permanent shelter and we know that's been a huge goal both for the town and for us. Uh, and I know Allegra has been working very hard too um, to, to support that. So do we have any more information about getting a permanent shelter? No. It's getting cold out there. There are lots of homeless people who need spaces. So, um, and Ashley, you mentioned that as well in terms of the waiting list for, for um, you know, for Craig's door, and I'm sure the survival center has a lot of people who need um, to be housed. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I think you know the good news is Craig's door is will operate you know the shelter this year, and I think they've um, you know they were I think they were successful at um, applying to DHCD for funding. You know, there was a whole different process of how shelters throughout the state would get operational funding, um, but I think you know they're definitely planning on having a, you know the seasonal shelter. In terms of a permanent shelter, the town is still, you know, looking at sites and really trying to get something to happen. I mean, when I say something to happen, it would mean, right, securing a site or somehow getting, you know, a person sale or something. But really, you know, it could be, you know, two to three years before there is a, you know, if, it, if something has to be built, it's like, you know, everything's slow. But the town is still, you know, looking at sites to try to get something um, going. But I don't, you know, that that's all I know. There isn't, you know, there isn't like you know, say the winner or, um, <laughs> you know, I think Craig's doors has been really fortunate. And I think, you know, there's, it speaks to, you know, some of the property owners in town and in the area that are willing to, you know, to ha have them. So, you know, I think the University Motor Lodge, you know, the Lutheran Church and some of their sites they've been using, I think they will be able to continue to use, which is really, you know, really great. Are we, do we know anything about Hadley? Because I had heard that the Econo, Econo Lodge was going to be turned into a shelter, or maybe I got the wrong. Yeah, no, uh, Val, or, there's two projects in Hadley. You know, Valley was hoping to turn it into some studio apartments with some maybe transitional housing, and then there might have been something else. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, you know, I've heard, I've heard, heard that too. I don't have anything specific. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the concern is uh, just listening to today about um, how cold it is and how shelters turn people out early in the morning. They have nowhere to go. Um, you know, for the unhoused, there there's no place to wash, no place to go to the bathroom. Um, restaurants don't let them go, and then they use you know outside, and then you know they get arrested. And so I think it's just so important that um, we keep this on the table and do as much as we can to ensure that people who are unhoused um, are going to be safe over the winter. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, so, yeah, I think, right. I think hand in hand with the permanent shelter would be, whether you want to call it like a, a day center or a resource center or, right, if, if not on that site, or at least trying to make connections with other services and agencies. So, right, right now there is a gap, you know, right, um, both, you know, year round and then day to day when there's no, there's really not a lot available. So that leads us to ARPA. Because I think we all had major hopes with regard to ARPA. We were asked to submit proposals. We submitted multiple proposals, um, and so we still haven't heard anything about you know where the town's anything. heading on ARPA and housing. Yeah, you know the town has used some funds to do you know some energy efficient retrofits. We've done some emergency. You know we still have an emergency assistance program. We did one. Um, you know then there's larger pots of money for some housing, and so you know. Staff, we've discussed that with the with the CPA request for housing. There's also been some discussion about, um, you know, would ARPA money be available, right? Because there's more, you know, there's a few million in housing requests, and so, um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think anything's quite been decided. The town's still hopeful there's funding for a permanent shelter for sheltering in ARPA money, and so we're we're still um, hoping that something can be found in the next year to spend the ARPA money, but then there's still money for housing. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I mean, I think when Dave was gonna come next month, I think it could be good to talk about that. You know, is there, 
you know, in addition to the sheltering piece, is there any, you know, what kind of process is there for say the, the housing ARPA money? Um, you know, no, our you know, Valley put in their CPA, you know, in their pro forma budget, right? I think they were at, they were, they were going to come and ask for, you know, whatever. Uh, I forget how much it was, a few hundred thousand in ARPA funding. Um, so, where does one like the? I think it's ARPA funds that provided the funding that the bid used to give a bunch of grants to businesses. Where does somebody go and look just to find out what the town is doing or what it what it is that it has done? Because it seems like it's done something. How do you find out about that? This is just me being a curious person. I don't know that this even has anything directly to do with the housing trust, but I'm like, how do you find out that stuff? Mm. Yeah, I'm looking as you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's... um. Under, in the finance department, uh, under finance, there's a, you know, they have the American Rescue Plan Act, and then there's, you know, there's some quarterly reports and product information. Uh, at one point, I thought we were going to have a little bit more of a, um, kind of like a, uh, like a, like a dashboard of sorts yeah. that would show it. Um, and that might be on Engage Amherst. So yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly, uh, Carol, to your question. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, for no, whatever I mean, town, you right. do know, or for your honesty, or whatever, all of yeah. you above. I mean, I know the town's spent money. I just it's interesting, right? You say, "Oh, well, where? What are the pieces?" And I, you know, I could say, "Yeah, we spent." I know. Oh, we've helped the bid or the chamber. We've helped businesses, and I know we've done, you know, um, you know, emergency response crews, uh, and some town staff. You know, some staff were tasked with working during the um, during the pandemic, and they received some type of you know stipend or pay. But I, yeah, if you asked me now, I, I, I just have to go to the website and keyword search. <laughs> well, just... if you find out anything, let us know. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so Nate, it seems that what I heard was, is that uh, there's a commitment for Dave to come in November because we've been asking him to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we are, I think, I don't care. Was it you? We, we, he had reached out or maybe he, maybe he did say it was November. It'd be a good month or the last time I talked to him, I didn't actually ask him specifically about this meeting because the last time I talked to him, he said, ask me for November. So I will ask oh. again. <laughs> yeah. I didn't bother this time, given that conversation. Yeah, I think he's <clears> hopeful <throat> that in November, he can have updates on some of these things as opposed to just telling you, you know. That sounds good. Yeah. And it would be, you know, I will think, I, you know, anything about the shelter or property, you know, we'd go into an executive session. So, you know, that's an agenda item, would take a vote of um, the trust members. And then essentially anything that's an executive session really can't be spoken about outside of it, you know, um, just because it's, you know, the reason we go into it is it's, you know, there's sensitive material that could be damaging or, you know, hurt the process or whatever is being discussed. So, um and absolutely, I think we're, you know, we definitely would, um, you know, designate the last half hour to do that mm -hmm. if we could prepare for it, if we knew that he's coming yes. in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that would be great. Um, I think the other piece, too, is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't last year as part of the town's CPA proposal was to hire a housing individual, housing staff member? Yes. Right. So you have a housing staff member? No, no. We're, um, we had a job description. It's a little, it's interesting that um, we did some outreach and, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was going to be a, a part-time non-benefited position for up to three years. Um, you know, some initial outreach said, uh, some people said it would, it would be hard to find someone because, you know, you know, the, you know, yeah, you kind of have to balance like who, who can fill that position, someone who may already have some other job, right. Or, so we've been think strategizing about, um, how, how to do that. Um, it's also, you know, we can no longer hire the person as a contractor. They have to be a municipal employee. Not that it, they wouldn't be, but sometimes in the past we had done, we'd hired um, kind of that for that type of service we'd hired as a contractor. And it's been, it's becoming harder to do that. So, um, you know, I did, we met with HR and we kind of have a, um, we're trying to figure out a way to move that forward um, probably by the end of the year but not, they're not on board yet. 
Yeah. Well, the reason why I say that is because, you know, we as the housing trust were an arm of the Amherst mm -hmm. town to ensure, right. you know, that the issues of housing are addressed and that we should also be in sync with the town. So that's one of the reasons why we want to know, you know, what right. are the priorities? And this is, you know, I know, again, you're the messenger, but back for David and for, and it's good that Paul's on here. It's just, it's really important um, to know where things are at and how we can support each other on this. Right. So really good to know about Hickory Farm and ARPA, um, mm -hmm. as well as, um, you know, the permanent shelter. Right. Yeah. When the position's on board, I mean, really, they are focusing on just housing. So I, I'm assuming, too, that they'd be also to assist, you know, the trust and myself and, you know, town in a number of ways. Um, and some of it might be just, you know, Carol had asked, and I sent out, it's off topic, but, you know, the subsidized housing inventory. And, you know, that's the state's recognized list of housing. And at one point, we were hoping to have a little bit uh, kind of more fine grain spreadsheet and then also maybe having it mapped, um, you know, online and a few things. And so it's something we've talked about, but, you know, this position, for instance, could just could actually do that, you know, finally get a database together of a little bit more information. And, you know, I think the, the subsidized housing inventory is pretty good. Uh, you know, one nice thing is that there's not really any expiring uses anytime soon. So in the last few years, there's been a few projects where the affordable units would lapse. And I think we're... We're, we're safe, quote, safe until like 2036, I think is what the most recent one is. But most of them now we've been able to negotiate, you know, longer leases or restrictions. So, um, you know, I think we're in a good position there at least. Okay, uh, unless anyone else has any comments or uh, any questions about the updates that we just went over, I will hand it over to Carol. Um, I'm wondering if I have a question or an update or a con or a, I, don't, I wonder if everybody, it was news to me at some point that that uh, subsidized housing inventory counts all the bill, all the units in a, in a property in the affordable housing list, even though some of them may not be affordable. It even count, it counts the ones that are market rate units if they're in a project that was built with a bunch of affordable units in it. So the first time I heard that, I thought it was crazy and I'm not sure I still think anything else, but I just think we should all know that in case we don't, because at least I didn't, and maybe I'm the only one who didn't, but I just wanted to point it out. <clears throat> so, um, so basically there's like a lot less, I mean, I live in North Square Apartments and like there's less than 20% or less is affordable and they're counting every single unit and that's 260 units and only about 26 are affordable. So it's a fraction. Well, it's 20%. I mean, it 20, 20 to at least 20% of the units have to be affordable in a rental development and then all the units in the development count. I mean, that's, that's statewide. And so, you know, I know every... Yeah. If you look at every SHI in the community, you might say, well, if you know most of the SHI are rentals, then you're right. If they say they have a thousand affordable units, it might really only be 200. It, the state did that as a way to incentivize um, the development of affordable housing with the comprehensive permit, you know, 40B. So um, yeah, it's a little misleading. Um, you know, we say, oh, you're above 10% of your housing is affordable, but it's you know, it isn't it, really. I, I mean, I, I mean, in a way, I like that kind of development that's mixed. Uh, the one that I lived in, Pomeroy Lane, was, but I know it's listed with 25 units as affordable and at least uh, six or eight or something. I don't know. I'm sure it was more than 20% were affordable, but some of them were market rate units. But it's a great way to live because it bridges some of the gaps that would otherwise be there. So I don't. I like it as a way of building things. I just wish, even if they all count, I would love to have a list that showed this many count in this thing, but the actual number of affordable units is whatever it is. Um, yeah. so, you could, so at least you could at least see what was going on. So I'm sorry, that's maybe a pet peeve of mine and I maybe shouldn't be bringing it up here, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew that situation. And now we'll go on to announcements unless anybody has anything else to say. I think get in my own way here. Uh, the only announcement I have is that on Monday the 17th at 2 p.m. 
is the Community Individual Services Forum on online run, Pamela Schwartz's thing. If you want to go to it and don't have a link, you could ask Erica or, or I. It's all online. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Rob does. He just Rob. sent us one. <laughs> yeah, well, the Amherst Community Land Trust is having a, a fall get together and walk um, starting oh, cool. at two o'clock on Saturday at Mill River. So a chance to just informally uh, get to know us and, and find out what we do. Great, thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Two o'clock on Saturday, Mill River. He sent all of us uh, the information. Really? I yes. Just before the meeting. Time. Yep. Oh, okay. I didn't see it yet. <laughs> Okay, any any other announcements? Uh, any public comments from any of the couple, three people that are attending at the moment? I don't see any hands. Do you see anything, Nate? I don't, and yeah, there weren't any, any other comments, I don't think. Okay. Um, are there, and if there are future agenda items, please send them to Erica and I. Um, our next meeting is Thursday, November 10th. Uh, I believe that at that meeting, we will have the presentation we had maybe going to be have tonight when the town council will present information about their property transfer fee proposal and whatever else but if people have other thoughts for agenda items please let us know and then is there anybody have any last comment that they want to make about anything then i believe that i shall close the meeting at 8 52 by my clock thank you everybody for being here and see you in a month if not before thanks everyone and and Thank look you. For the memo from Thank us you. from Nate. Good night. Yes. Okay, great. Good night.